Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Restoration Church. Let's stand together on our feet and worship God together. Come on, sing this with me. I was buried. Come on. 
together. continue to sing. Let's continue to cast our mind on Calvary like that song said. Continue to be encouraged by the gospel and what that means for you as a church. That Jesus came and he lived the perfect sinless life that we couldn't. 
He died on the cross for our sins so that now we can have salvation through him. Amen? So be encouraged by that. And right now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you to have a moment of prayer just to remind yourself of why we gather. We don't gather just because it's Sunday, but we gather to worship Jesus and praise him and thank him, right? So be encouraged, church. Take a moment and pray and thank the Lord for who he is to you.
Church family, aren't we grateful for Jesus this morning? It is Jesus alone that saves. It is faith in Jesus alone that helps us experience the grace and the love of God. It's not religion. It's not going to church. It's not even being perfect. It is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus in which we are saved. Aren't we excited? Aren't we happy for that this morning, church family? I'll tell you what. There are so many people in this world thinking that it's Jesus and religion. Or it's Jesus and stop sinning. Or it's Jesus and fill in the blank. But it's Jesus alone. That's why we gather. That's why we worship him every single Sunday. Well, guys, as we continue, go ahead and greet one another before we get started. You got one minute. find a seat find a seat if you find yourself talking to people a little longer than the one minute that's great get their number make a coffee hangout do something but we're about to get into the word of god so find a seat <laughs> go ahead and find a seat find a seat find a seat and good morning. By the way, my name is Angel Paz. I have the privilege of being one of the directors of ministry here at Restoration Church. And if it's your first time or if you're returning, we want to welcome you. Church family, can we welcome our first time guests together? We're so glad that you're here. We hope you feel like home. We hope you feel um, welcomed. Like this is a place that you would love to join the family in. And if it is your first time, I want you to go ahead and scan this QR code that's going to come up on the screen. It's it's pretty simple. You scan it, it takes you straight to our website where you can fill in the next steps card and it's going to ask you for your name, your number. This is what it's going to look like actually. You scan this or you can go to rchomestead.org and you can click one of those two tabs that says next steps and then you just say, hey, it's my first time here. It's going to ask you for your name and your phone number and then someone throughout the week is going to reach out to you to welcome you to our church. But go ahead and do that. Please, please do that. It takes a lot of work to do that. To, to make the website look nice like that for you guys, please. So if it is your first time, we can't wait to get to know you even more. And we hope to see you here next week, of course. And before we even continue, I want to thank you so much for your giving, guys, because through your giving, we're able to do a lot of cool different things. Um, a few different ways you can give is through the website, you can text to give, or through the offering box. And one of the cool things that we can do through your giving, through our church, and really through all of us here at the church, is serve with the Chapman program every once every five weeks. Now, over the next few weeks, actually over the next month, we have teamed up with them to gather some goods for the Chapman Drive where you can help serve under-resourced families. And so this drive is going to be going from the 19th, which was last week, all the way through March 19th. So one month. We have one month to provide for families. And it's going to be pretty simple stuff that we can get at Walmart or the dollar store. We want to ask that you get brand new things um, if, if you're able to bring them. Even if it's one toothbrush, that one toothbrush will make a difference. And so here's a list of the stuff. You can take out your phone and take a picture of this. Please, please, please take a picture of this so you can remember, so you can bring stuff, so we can support these families, so we can be the hands and feet of Jesus for these families. Now, for some of us who are a little more old school, we're like, man, I don't want to take a photo. I don't even got a phone. I want something physical. I got to because we printed these nice little handouts for you guys. On the way out, you can go ahead and grab some of these. It's going to have everything. It looks like a little grocery list. You can just go ahead and check it off, take it to the store, and you can have this physical copy with you. So please, on the way out, it's going to be on your left-hand side. I think we might have some on the right, but on your left-hand side, you can go ahead and grab one of those. But also, um, today at 4 o'clock, can you say 4 o'clock? 
Now say it like you mean it with your chest. Ready? Four o'clock. Four o'clock today, we have a members meeting. So if you are a member of the church, we want to invite you back at four o'clock so that you could be a part of this meeting. There's going to be a lot of good information. And also, it's going to be a good time um, for us to fellowship, to continue to get to know one another. Charles, back there, he's been preparing diligently some games for us to be able to play and fellowship as we prepare for this meeting. So it's going to be a really fun gathering that you don't want to miss out on. So today at four o'clock, please be sure to come back. And also, if you can stick around after the service today, Lou is going to be in back of the room. Um, we're going to start preparing for this meeting as soon as the service ends. So um, when service ends, I want to ask you guys, please go um, leave the room. Not because we hate you. I promise we want you to stay, but we just really needed to get rid of some of these rows. And for some of us who um, you might be able to stay and help um, to set up, we would really, really appreciate that. We need to get rid of like these first eight rows, take the chairs out, set up some tables, make it look a little cool in here. So today, right after service, Lou will be standing in the back, and we would love your help in that. And so as we get into this time of pastoral prayer, earlier today, we had um, Miche and Yanelli um, come to the first service so that we could pray over them. Now, if you haven't been updated on what's going on in Miche and Yanelli's life, they're a part of this church, and they have been forever, I think, since literally the beginning. And um, unfortunately, the, um, their babies, um, she gave birth a few months early. And so um, the babies are in the NICU right now. They're, they're taking care of them. But as you can imagine, if you've ever had a kid or, or you can just see it, um, you can imagine the heartbreak that they're going through. It, it's, a, it's one of those situations where you want to do everything you can, but you really can't do anything. You have to have faith in the Lord and trust that he's going to provide and he's going to be there with the doctors in the hospital. And so as we take this time in pastoral prayer, I want all of us to join in, not just in praying for them right now, but to pray for them throughout the week and over the next few months, really. We want to make sure that we're covering them in prayer, making sure that, you know, we're asking the Lord and the Holy Spirit to be there in the hospital, to be with the doctors and to take care of those babies. So let's pray together and then we can get into it. Father God, we lift up our brother and sister Misha to you, Lord. They're recently married. They've been married for less than a year or a year now. And you've blessed them with two beautiful babies, two twins, God. Lord, in this moment of need and, and heartbreak, Lord, I pray that you would comfort them. We pray that you would comfort them. We pray that you would be with them in the hospital. That you would be with them when they're at home and they're not able to be right next to their babies. Lord, please comfort them. Give them peace. Give them strength. Lord, I pray that in, in the moments where the enemy might try to attack, might try to take away their faith. Lord, I pray that you would give them an extra portion of, your, of faith in you. That you would give them strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. That you, you would help them lean on you and that in this moment of weakness, their faith wouldn't dwindle, but it would just become more and more strengthened. That they would be a marriage, that they would be parents, that they would be a couple and just an example of Christ that we could all look to and be encouraged because even in their weakness, they're pursuing you. Lord, even in their weakness, they come here on church on a Sunday and they worship. During first service, they listen and they receive of the message and the gospel. They partook of the Lord's Supper. Lord, I pray that you would continue to strengthen their faith. Lord, I pray that you would continue to surround them with people who love them, who will continue to care for them and help them through this season. Lord, I pray that you would be with the doctors, that you would be with everyone and everything in the hospital, with every machine, with every person in every room, that there would be something so different that people see because of Yanelli and Micha's faith. That when people walk by their room or walk into their room, they would feel something so different because of the family that they are surrounded by that has so much faith in your name because of Gilbert and Natalie and Angel and everyone there who has faith in your name, who's waiting expectantly, Lord, knowing that we can be hopeful in the God that we listen to, that we pray to, that we pursue because you are a God who listens to your children. And you say that when we pray to you, if we pray with faith, Lord, that you will move, that you will bless and so, Lord, we confidently pray for them without doubt in our heart, knowing that you are listening and that you are doing something right now. You work every good and perfect thing. You work, you work everything for the good of those who love you, for the good of those who pursue you, God. Even in the moments 
when it's the things that we don't like, you are still moving and you are still blessing and you are still doing something. So Lord, we pray for them and we lift them up in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Angel. And good morning, Restoration Church. Awesome. Once again, thank you for being here today. My name is Sebastian Masson, and I am grateful that I not only am able to, I not only get to be one of your pastors here, but I also am able to bring the word this morning. So for the past few months, we've been, we've been walking through the gospel according to Luke in our sermon series titled, All Things Closely. And we discussed uh, at the beginning of, of this whole thing, when we started Luke chapter 1, we discussed that the author Luke is writing to a man named Theophilus. And Theophilus was uh, a man of high rank in the Roman authorities, but it's also believed that Theophilus was looking to know more about Jesus. So Luke, he, he writes this letter to Theophilus so that he may have certainty in what he has been taught. Also, Luke being a physician and historian, he writes a very detailed description, detailed account of the life of Jesus. And today we're going to look at one of those accounts as Jesus kicks off his ministry in his hometown of Nazareth. Now, this message today is actually directly tied to the great message that Angel preached last week uh, because Angel discussed a claim that Jesus made. Jesus made a claim about himself. But today we're going to talk about the people's response to that claim. So as we dive into our text this morning, I'll ask if you could please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. We're going to be in Luke 4, and I'm going to start reading at verse 16. Uh, But the passage that we're really uh, unpacking is from verses 22 through 30. But if I don't read 16 on, you're not going to get it. So we're going to read from 16 through, but I'm really going to hone in on 22 through 30. Uh, So Luke 4, starting at verse 16. Also, uh, I would ask uh, that we remember that I'm going to read this passage, and when I'm done, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord, and I would love a response from you, uh, which would be, thanks be to God. God. Yes. So again, we're going to be in Luke 4, 16 through 30. If you're there and you're ready to go, say word. word. I like it. Okay, verse 16. (laughs) <laughs> they could read it, it'd be better. Um, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to proclaim, uh, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him. And marveled at, it, at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there are many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months And a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they can throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. This is a word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, Once 
once again, it's a humbling experience to come here before you, our creator of everything, the father of mercies and God of all comfort, the God who can do far more than what we even ask. Father, we come before your throne this morning hungry for your word, thirsty for you, for the living waters that come through you, Father. Father, I pray that as we dive into your text this morning, Lord, that you speak to us, that our hearts are softened to receive, that our minds are emptied to intake, and that our ears are open to hear, and that our eyes are opened to see what you are speaking to us today. Father, help us in our worship. Continue to speak to us this morning. And Lord, we are just so grateful to be here amongst our brothers and sisters in Christ, worshiping you. Father, we love you and we thank you. We pray for all these things. And God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Okay, so if you've been living in Homestead or in South Miami for a few years, you would have noticed that there has been a major transition in our highways when you are going northbound. For us here, we know that when you're going north on the turnpike, there is a point after you pass 152nd Street that you are met with a fork in the road. And you need to decide whether or not you're going to continue driving on the turnpike or you're going to take the alternate hallway or highway, which is the Palmetto Expressway. But if you remember, there was a time when in order to stay on the turnpike, you would have to stay in the right lanes. And to get on the Palmetto Expressway, you would have to stay in the left lanes. And now it was like this for a very, very, very long time. And it probably started when God created the earth. He made it this way. It's turnpike right, Palmetto left. Well, about three years ago, some brilliant mind decided to change what God had ordained. <laughs> and what seemed to be like an overnight miracle, the highways were changed. And now to get on the turnpike, you no longer go right, but now you have to go left. And to get on the palmetto, you no longer go left, but you have to go right. And this might have brought the most confusion to our city I think we've ever seen. <laughs> I've, I've never seen so many sad faces as they are driving by looking out their window, realizing they just got on the wrong highway. And still to this day, like when I drive and I reach that fork in the road, I have a mini anxiety attack. I'm literally thinking, well, left, right, I don't know. I, just take one. <laughs> but I remember when they made this change, uh, I had a friend of mine uh, who doesn't leave Homestead too often, um, but he needed a ride to an appointment in Kendall. So I said, hey, no problem, I'll take you to, the, to that appointment. And as we were driving, we reached this fork in the road. And since we need to get on the Palmetto, I said, hey, I, I'm going to stay on the right. So I'm in the right lanes. And I'll never forget my friend staring at me. He's like, hey, you need to get over on, on the left. And I said, no, they changed the highways recently. I got to stay on the right in order to get on the Palmetto. And that's when my friend, he, he kind of started letting me have it. He's like, they changed the highways? Really? <laughs> like, it's been like this my whole life, and I'm older than you. Like, they would never do that. It's like, you need to get over right now. This is going to take us way out of the way. Get over right now. And this is when I was like, hey, I'm just going to stay quiet, and I'm just going to keep driving. And as he huffed and puffed and stared out the window, oh, we're going to be late. Oh, I can't believe you're not listening to me. As we kept driving, and he kept looking out the window, he started to realize he was on the Palmetto, and that they actually changed the highways. And that's when he got quiet. And it was about five minutes of driving in silence. <laughs> and all I heard at the end of that was, hmm, <laughs> when he realized that he was wrong. But listen, we all do this at one time or another, where we think that we are right about a certain topic or a certain discussion, where we get prideful about it. We think that we know the right answer, and we're certain that we are right. And we'll argue about it. We'll get upset about it, only to find out sometime later that we were wrong the whole time. And when that happens, our pride takes a shot, and it's really just a humbling experience. And as we look at our passage today, that's, we're going to see a lot of pride from the people in the city of Nazareth. 
And not only are we going to see their pride, but we're also going to see in, in the way how they respond out of their pride, there's not much humility because they think they know what the Scripture says. They think they know who they are. They think they know who Jesus is. And they're not going to be happy when Jesus tells them that they're wrong. And last week, Angel, he went over the fact that Jesus, uh, after returning from being tempted by Satan, he came back into the towns full of the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't come out of those temptations licking his wounds and saddened like he was almost defeated, but rather he came out like a conqueror, and he came out with power, and he was making stops along the way, preaching with power in the synagogues, healing people. And then here we see he finally shows up at his hometown in Nazareth. This was a small town in which almost everyone would know each other. And it was here where he goes into the synagogue, as was his custom. And as he was with all the people, they asked him to read a passage and and to teach them something. Because they've heard of all these great things Jesus had been doing. So Jesus grabs a scroll of Isaiah and he turns to where it writes in Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then in verse 20, it says that he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus, he he quotes this passage which the prophet Isaiah 700 years earlier had prophesied about the coming Messiah, and Jesus claims, this is me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and He's anointed me. I've fulfilled this scripture today. And then it's believed that He then went on to explain what He came to do. That He came to proclaim good news to the poor, bring liberty to those captive, sight to the blind, and liberty to those oppressed. And then in verse 22, where we're starting our passage today, it says, All spoke well of Him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. It says they all spoke well. They were all marveling at his words. They were in amazement how Jesus spoke with these words. They were enamored with how his speech was submerged in knowledge, how his words were covered and dipped in grace, and how he spoke with an unmatched authority. But at the same time, as they were amazed with what flowed from the lips of Jesus, and as his words pierced the ears of everyone in the synagogue, two problems would emerge to the surface. And the first is what we see at the end of verse 22. We see their immediate response. It says that they were marveling at his words, they were speaking well of him, but then, it's, then they say, Is not this Joseph's son? Is not this Joseph's son? You see, this is Jesus' hometown. They all know Jesus. They know Mary, his mother. They know Joseph, his father. They know his brothers and sisters. They've seen Jesus work with his father, Joseph, as a carpenter. In fact, he probably built some of the furniture and, and different things that were in their homes. And, and they've seen him grow up right in front of them. He's gone to feasts with them. He's gone to weddings with them. He celebrated birthdays with them. They all know Jesus. And they're like, isn't this Joseph's son and he's saying that he's the Messiah? (laughs) I want everyone to think right now of someone you grew up with, just as a brother, a cousin, whoever it may be, someone you, you were raised with. Now imagine that person that's in your mind right now, at 30 years old, they come up to you and say, hey, by the way, I'm the savior of the world. You'd probably be like, uh, no, nah, you're not. <laughs> you're from Homestead, bro. Like, you ain't. You ain't. <laughs> so they couldn't see how, how this Jesus, who they knew for their whole life, could be the Messiah. But listen, that wasn't the only issue. Because the second thing that they couldn't grasp was what he was actually saying. Jesus said that not only was he the Messiah, but he came for the poor, for the captives, for the blind, and for the oppressed. And the people listening must have said amongst themselves, But Jesus, not all of us are poor. We're not captive. 
We're not blind. We could see you, and we're not oppressed. So you're saying that you're the Messiah and that you're coming for these type of people, but we are none of that. In fact, we're sons of Abraham. We're sons of Isaac and Jacob. We're of the 12 tribes of Israel. We are God's people. We've obeyed the scriptures. We've obeyed the rituals and ordinances. We've gone to all the feasts. We've done all the sacrifices. And we've paid all of our tithes. And we are righteous because of all these things that we do. But listen, here's an important aspect that we have to see. Is that our pride moves us to reject Jesus. Our pride moves us to reject Jesus. You see, the pride and self-righteousness of the people blinded them and closed their ears to hear what Jesus was actually saying. Because Jesus didn't just come for those who were suffering physically in these ways, like they thought, but he came for those suffering spiritually in these ways. So he didn't just come for those who were physically poor, but he came for those who were poor in spirit, meaning that they understand that they have no righteousness of their own. They know that they're sinners in their nature. And he didn't just come for those who were physically blind, but he came for those who were spiritually blind, meaning that they walk in darkness, that they couldn't understand the spiritual truths of the scriptures. And he didn't just come for those who were just physically oppressed, but he came for those who were spiritually oppressed. People overwhelmed by life circumstances where it feels like everything just weighs on your soul and you're just in anxiety and depressed and it's just, man, spiritually oppressed. Just this burden. And he didn't just come for those who were physically captive, but he came for those who were spiritually captive. As I was thinking about that this week, I just found it so interesting that prior to coming to faith in Jesus, we look at Christianity as something that will block us from what we actually want to do. People reject following Christ because they feel they will lose their freedom in life. People reject following Christ because they feel that they will lose their freedom in life, that they'll have to now obey by these, all these rules and regulations that the Bible brings up. And listen, I used to say the same thing. I used to say, no, 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 I'm not going to fully commit to Christ because then I can't have any more fun. And I'm having a lot of fun right now. I'm a good person, and I'm, that's enough. And listen, I was going to church every single week when I said that. So we have these thoughts that committing to Christ will cause us to lose our freedom. But listen, that's a deception from the pits of hell because it's actually the complete opposite. In fact, I was having a conversation with someone a while back and they made a statement that made me pause. And they said, you know, it's kind of unfair that people can live their whole lives in their sin and then at the very end of their lives they can come to Christ and they can go to heaven. And a lot of people think that, you know, it's unfair. They can live their whole lives in sin. And then at the end, they come to Christ, they go to, get to go to heaven. And then they said this, they said, it, it's like they got to have their cake and eat it too. And listen, that's where I pause and I, I say, you know, I disagree. Because listen, they had to go their whole life not knowing God's grace and compassion and love for them. A whole life of not knowing the peace and comfort that Jesus provides. A whole lifetime separated from God. A whole lifetime where pride and gossip and emptiness and slander just filtrate through your whole bones, never finding true fulfillment in anything. A whole lifetime of confusion as to why they're even here in the first place and what their purpose is. A whole lifetime of being in bondage to sin, never knowing that they were actually captives to it and in chains to their sin. You see, being able to live your life in sin is not freedom. That's captivity. Because the truth is that when you come to Christ, that's when you're actually free. Because before you do, you're in total bondage to Satan and to your sin. And it's only through Jesus in which those chains are broken. It's only because of what Jesus has done. It's only through him and through the Holy Spirit working within you that you are even able to turn from your sin because without Jesus, without what he's done, and without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't even be able to do that. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, I have come to break those chains. 
Yet the people responded with, Is not this Joseph's son? Talking about being the Messiah? We know him. And listen, we can scoff at the response of of the people here. But how many of us think that we know Jesus yet really don't know him at all? How many of us come to church and maybe even tithe and serve, yet when we walk out of this property, we look and sound like everyone else that's shackled to sin? How many of us marvel at his words, yet reject the life of obedience to him because we feel that we will lose our freedom? Because our pride and our self-righteousness says that we are good people. And it's in that pride that we say, yeah, I know who you are, Jesus. I know who you are. I've heard of you. I know you. But in order for me to really believe that you're the Savior, in order for me to really say that you are Lord and Savior, that you are the Messiah, then I first need to see a sign. I need you to show me something. And that's what we see here in the people of the synagogue. They can't believe it until they see a sign. And listen, they've they've heard Jesus did signs and miracles while he was going through all the towns, uh, and, and they want the same thing. And we know that because of Jesus' response here in verse 23. Look at that with me. It says, And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. So Jesus, he sees right through the people, and he says, hey, look, I know what you're going to say. I know you're going to quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Do what we've heard that you have done. And in other words, what they're saying, they're saying, if you're the Messiah, prove it. If you are who you say you are, show me. Now, if you've been journeying with us through the Gospel of Luke, you may have recognized that this is not the first time that Jesus hears this statement. Because, in fact, that's the same statement Satan used when he was tempting Jesus. He says, if you are who you say you are, then show me. If you're really the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. If you are really the Son of God, jump off the pinnacle of this temple. And listen, since that temptation period, we'll see this statement arise time and time and time again. We're going to see it throughout the entire Gospel of Luke. And the thing is that this statement never really even stopped being made. We've seen it through generation, through generation, and there are even some of you here today that may be saying it right now. If you are who you say you are, then just show me. But listen, we all know very well that Jesus doesn't always do what we ask him to do. And he doesn't do it here either. But in fact, what he decides to do is give them, is to speak hard truth to them. And he does so by recalling two accounts from the Old Testament. And the first one is with the prophet Elijah. So read with me in verse 24. He says, And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. So Jesus, he starts this off by saying, hey, listen, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. He goes, I know I'm coming here. I'm not going to be accepted by you. This is my hometown. He goes, let me give you a couple examples of unwelcome prophets in their hometown. Let's start with Elijah. Okay, so Elijah, if we remember, he was a prophet during the time of King Ahab. And King Ahab was king over all of the kingdom of Israel. And he's also well known by his wife because he married uh, what's called the evil queen, Jezebel. Okay, and Jezebel, she was not a Jew, she was a Gentile, um, but she, she was evil. And, and she helped turn Ahab's heart, and Ahab and, and Jezebel, they led the people of Israel to stop worshiping the one true God and led them to worship the false god of Baal. And Baal worship, it flourished in Israel during this time. And because of this, God sent the prophet Elijah to pronounce judgment on them. And he goes up to King Ahab and he says, hey, there's going to be a severe drought 
And that's exactly what happened where the Lord shut the skies for three and a half years. There was no rain. And this caused famine to happen all over the nation of Israel. And what Jesus points out here is that during this horrible three and a half year period, there were many widows in Israel that were suffering because they didn't have anyone that could help them. Their husbands weren't there, and the people that would take care of the widows, they were unable to help these widows any longer. But then he says that Elijah, God's prophet, was not sent to any of these widows in Israel, but rather he was sent to a Gentile woman, which is a non-Jewish woman named Zarephath. Now, Zarephath, she was known to believe in the one true God, uh, and it also says that she was from the land of Sidon. So two things would have stuck out to Israel right there immediately. First was the fact that she was a Gentile. This would have outraged them that Elijah wouldn't be sent to help the people of Israel, their own people, and he would be sent to help a Gentile woman. But the second thing that would have stood out is that Zarephath was from the land of Sidon. And Sidon was where Jezebel, their evil queen, was from. So that's just adding more salt to that wound, okay? (laughs) So Jesus brings this up, and then he doesn't stop there. Because then he goes on to state another instance of, with, of this with Elijah's predecessor, whose name was Elisha. And we see that summary in verse 27. He says, And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. So once again, we see an, another example of how Israel... That in Israel, they had a plenty of people with leprosy, a lot of people suffering from the disease of leprosy. Yet God sent his prophet Elisha, not to any of those in Israel, but he sent them to a Gentile named Naaman. And to make matters even worse, Naaman was an enemy military commander. In fact, he was the captain of the army of the king of Syria. But when the prophet Elisha, he hears that Naaman is seeking healing for, lep- for leprosy, He calls Naaman to come to him. He tells him, hey, go into the Jordan River, wash, and you will be clean. And at first, Naaman, he he says, no, I'm not going to do it. He he turns back away. But then eventually, he humbles himself, and he obeys Elisha's word, and then he was cured, and he acknowledged God as the one true God. So I know these are are two accounts. It's a lot to take in. But, But what we need to see here is the common action, which in which God's prophets were not sent to those in Israel but they were sent to those who would humble themselves before the Lord. He he would not send them to those who would not abandon their self-righteousness, those who refused to come before the Lord and acknowledge Him as their true God. God's prophets were not sent to those people, but they were sent to the Gentiles. And here's the thing. As the people in the synagogue, as they hear Jesus recount these occurrences, they weren't like, wow, that's a really good point. They weren't, they, they weren't, They didn't like that he brought these stories up, but rather they are outraged by the fact that he brought these up. That's why we have to see that our pride moves us to rage against Jesus. Our pride moves us to rage against Jesus. Look at verse 28. It says, When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and they drove him out of the town and they brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they can throw him down the cliff. You see, in our pride, when our expectations are not met, we rage. These words and and accounts that Jesus just said, these are offensive to them. First of all, they couldn't even uh, believe that he was the Messiah because they knew him. And they also thought the Messiah would come differently, that he would come with royalty and pomp. He'd be this massive military figure who would restore Israel. They didn't think that he'd come from their little town of Nazareth. And then on top of that, they thought that they were right with God because they were born of Abraham's lineage. And that was the most important thing to them. They were God's people. And then on top of that, the Messiah was to come only for the people of Israel. He wasn't to come to the Gentiles. He was not to go to outsiders. 
And then Jesus brings these accounts up that the people detested. They didn't like reading these accounts. This is not what they wanted to hear. The Messiah was to come for the people of Israel, those who have done the right things and born in the right lineage. So when Jesus says these things, he doesn't meet their expectations for the coming Messiah. And because of that, and because of the words he said, they rage. And they were filled with wrath, and they rose up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the edge of the cliff, and were ready to push him off. <clears throat> Sorry, I need water. <clears throat> If you ever had a couple hundred people stare at you, drink water is interesting. <laughs> but listen, in all seriousness, like this is so, this is sad. This is sad here because, because of their expectations, because he didn't meet their expectations, they rejected the one who they had been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds of years. The people of Israel had been in a season of expectation for the coming Messiah, but when he didn't meet their expectations, they rejected him. They raged against him. They wanted to kill him. They didn't even want him around anymore. If Jesus didn't do and say what they wanted him to do and say they couldn't believe and they missed out on their long-awaited Messiah who was right in front of them. Listen, there are some of us here today that are expecting things from Jesus. There are some of us here today who are not really wanting to know Jesus on a personal level, but rather you're looking for Jesus to do something in your life. You're looking for the miracle rather than a relationship with him. You may know about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. And I'm here today to tell you that our pride and our self-centered expectations will blind us and it'll close our ears from actually getting to know him. Listen, I, I've met men over the, over the past decade that have come to the church or come to our groups, and, and they, a lot of times people come in with these uh, problems where they're, they're about to get divorced or they, they've really messed up in life and things are just not going well at all. And, and they come to the group thinking that if they would just come to church more regularly, come to the groups, that then God will fix everything for them right away. But then what happens when it, when it doesn't happen when they want it? I never see them again. I've seen many people who, when the struggle is real in life, when life gets really hard, true suffering hits, they pray, God, remove the suffering, heal the hurt. But if it doesn't happen the way they expect it to happen and when they want it to happen, they reject him. And my question to all of us is if Jesus doesn't meet our expectations, if he doesn't answer our prayers and give us exactly what we want when we want it, will we reject him? Do we follow Jesus for the miracle or for the relationship? Do we say, Jesus, I'll believe in you, but you first have to show me a sign? Listen, what we have to see from our passage is that our sinful pride and expectations will lead us to reject and rage against Jesus, but humility moves us to respond to Jesus. Humility moves us to respond to Jesus. Do you know why Elijah and Elisha were sent to Zarephath and Naaman and why that they were actually saved and why they were healed? It was because they humbled themselves before the Lord, the one true God. You see, they, the humble, they will acknowledge that they are poor in spirit. They will acknowledge that they are captives to sin and to Satan. They will acknowledge that they are spiritually oppressed in their lives. And the humble acknowledge that they are not good, that they're born with a sinful nature in dire need of a Savior. But here's what I want us all to hear. Listen, not only all of that, but the humble also acknowledge that they have been prideful and have rejected Christ. Because the truth is that we all, at one time or another, have been like, just like these Israelites and rejected Jesus. We have all thought that we were good enough people and that we had our stuff together. We have all looked for the miracle over the relationship. We have all set self-centered expectations of Jesus in our minds and hearts. And we have all raged against Jesus with either our thoughts, with our words, or in just the way that we live our lives. You see, we have all 
placed Jesus at the crest of the cliff in rage, and we corner him, and we put his heels on the soft rocks that trickle over the edge, ready to push him out of our lives for good. But church, what's beautiful is that Jesus is not confined to the edge of a cliff. And the people of Nazareth, they get to see this firsthand. Read 29 again with me. Okay, he says, And they rose up, and they drove him out of the town, and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they can throw him down the cliff. Now look at verse 30. It says, But passing through their midst, he went away. Listen, the people were looking for a miracle. He just gave them one. It just wasn't the one they wanted. But as they were about to throw him off the cliff, it says that he just passed right through their mist. He just walked right through an angry mob and there was nothing they could do about it. And why? Because his time had not yet come. There were still things that he had to do. He had, he had to do certain things. So this was not going to happen this way. So he passed through their mist and it says that he went away. But what, the question is, what did he go away to do? Well, I will tell you, he went away to proclaim good news to the poor to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. He went away to set li at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He went away to do the will of his Father, and he went away to endure the cross. You see, he went away in order to die for the sins of all his people, and he went away to call back all those who have rejected him. You see, because even though they rejected him in Nazareth, he still died for them. Yes. And even though we have rejected him, he still died for us. Yes. So as we have once placed Jesus at the edge of the cliff, as we have once rejected him, and maybe you're here today rejecting him, I need you to know and I need us to remember that Jesus came to die for those who reject him. The proud reject, the proud rage, yet the humble respond. And a good summary statement to wrap all this up. Salvation is for those who release their pride and respond in humility to what Christ has done. Salvation is for those who release their pride and respond in humility to what Christ has done. And how do we respond in humility? Well, we respond in repentance. We respond by acknowledging that we have been prideful and that we've rejected him. That we are sinners in need of a Savior. And we respond by saying, Jesus, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus, you are who you say you are. I, and I am poor in the Spirit. I'm a captive to my sin. I'm blind. I'm oppressed. And yet I repent. And I believe. Father, help me to see you as you are. Give me the Holy Spirit to illuminate your scriptures, to show me my sin. Father, help me release my expectations of you. Whatever happens in my life, I understand that you are in control and that you see me and you hear me and you see every tear drop from my face and you hear every cry that comes from my lips. Father, as you call me to yourself, humble me at the foot of your cross. James 4, 6, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Church family, as we humble ourselves this morning, let us be enamored with God's grace for us that abounds time and time and time again. He gives us grace. He gives us this relationship with him when we don't deserve it and we've done nothing to, to achieve it. He gives it to us because he wants to give it to us because of his great mercy and his great love for us. Lastly, as we, as we look at the people in the synagogue, we notice that while their eyes were fixed on Jesus, their hardened hearts were moved, but not in a good way. Their hearts were moved in anger, so much so that they rose up to drive him out. But listen, while they rose up, I also have to acknowledge that many of us sit in churches, yet drive him out in our hearts. So I'll end with a question. Are your hearts moved to drive him out or are your hearts moved to draw near to him? Will we humble ourselves and receive or will we hold on to our pride and reject him? You see, Jesus humbled himself from the throne of God to save a people who would step off their throne of self 
and acknowledge that he is Lord and that he is Savior? Will you reject or will you respond? Let us pray. Father, once again, uh, we are amazed by your word. We are marveled by the grace and the words that come through the scripture. But Father, I pray that it doesn't stop there. I pray that we are not just marveled at your words, but I pray that as we hear your words, we respond in humility by claiming you as Lord and Savior. I pray that we just don't listen to your words, be amazed by them, and then turn and reject you. But Father, that we turn to you. Father, I pray for regenerated hearts this morning. I pray for those of us who've come in here, who've, we've said that we've been Christians a long time, that have gotten caught up in the routine of just being a Christian, yet we have forgotten to grow in our relationship with you. Father, help us to know you. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit move within your people here this morning, that you draw people closer to yourself, that we will humble ourselves and repent of our ways and turn to you. Father, you are good. You are righteous. You are merciful. You are faithful. Lord, help us to honor you with every aspect and every ounce of our body. Father, we love you and pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we continue our time of worship, we are going to be taking the Lord's Supper together. And if you are not yet a believer, I want to ask that you sit back and you just maybe receive and see what's happening and, and maybe even pray in this moment. But for those of us who are believers, who do say we're Christian, we know the gospel, we've received Christ in our life, I want to invite you to this. But I want to challenge you. Are we doing this for religious activity, pushing Jesus out of our heart? Or are we doing this church thing, the Lord's Supper, going to church, worshiping and hearing the teaching in praise and honor of his name? You see, it's so easy to go to church. It's so easy to do the church things and just check it off and then sit back, not even realizing that we're pushing him out of our hearts. But we're doing the right thing here, but for the rest of the week, we're not. So I'm going to ask you, as you come up, I want to challenge you, reflect on that. Am I doing this as a religious activity, pushing Jesus out? Or am I doing this because I'm really in pursuit of him? And as you grab the Lord's Supper, go back to your seat. We can reflect on that and then we'll take it together. Usher.
you're able to please stand with me. As we take the Lord's Supper together, we do so in a posture of humility. As we receive Christ, we humble ourselves as we receive and reflect and remember on what Christ has done for us. And so when Jesus was seated at the table with the disciples, he tells them, this is my body. This bread resembles my body, which I have given to you. I'm giving this for you. Believer, Christian, child of God, I want you to understand that when Jesus gave his body to endure the wrath and the pain and the torture for our sins, that, and that includes all of your sins. The, the thing about repentance is that when we understand we've sinned, we also rejoice because the wrath that Jesus took on was enough. You don't have to feel guilty and conviction anymore. When you turn back to Christ, you understand that he took on the wrath for your sin. You have been forgiven. So let's eat and rejoice together. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine and he said, this is my blood and I give this to you. And in the same way, his blood was spilled for all of our sins. This is what, not only did he take on the wrath for all of our sins, but he says, I'm going to cure you. I'm going to make you pure from all of your sins, not just for the sins of today, but for tomorrow and for next year and the next 10 years and the rest of your life. Just continue to turn back to me. And so let's drink together and rejoice in that. Now that we've remembered, let's sing. Let's praise him together. Let's worship him together out loud. He deserves every breath, every word that we can sing. So let's do this together. Can we sing this together? When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ's own, cornerstone, a weak made strong, who saves us through the storm. He is Lord, He's Lord of all. Sing Christ alone. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, who saves us through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. And he shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's sing that again together.
God is good, amen? Before I close, I, I, want, I would like to do something special. So I, I need to ask Camila to come up here, please. Can I have my parents come up here? <laughs> it's going to be your tear fest as we walk out this door, okay? So this is my sister, Camila. Um, these are my parents, Ramon and Pilar. And the reason I've asked Camila to come up here um, is because she's going to be moving to, to Orlando. Um, I feel like I've known her her whole life. But in all seriousness, like, I love, I love my sister. And I remember about four or five years ago, she came up uh, to Port St. Lucie when I was there. And I remember her talking about Jesus. Like, I just saw this fire in her. And I was like, man, that's it. Like, the Lord is working in her. Spirit is working in her. So when I came back down here, I was like, I can't wait to do ministry with my sister. And sure enough, got here and she has she started a women's group that we have here that meets on Tuesday night. She's been leading them for two years strong. She's, she's done a lot for our church. She's invested a lot into the women here at our church and we just love her dearly. She's, she's, it's going to be hard to say goodbye. But at the same time, it's not goodbye. She'll be back here. She'll probably be here every other week because she misses us so much. So it's okay. But I would love to pray for her before we leave, uh, to send her off. Because this is, this is exciting. Because this is what we want as a church. We want to be able to send people off as missionaries and to go and speak the word of God and the gospel to all corners of the earth. So before we pray, I just want to read from Psalm 121 for my sister. It says this. It says, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, who made the heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Church family, can we, can we raise our right hand and pray? Father, first of all, we just come before you, giving you all glory and all praise. You are Lord of lords and King of kings. You are who you say you are, Father. And we worship you as such. And Father, what an amazing privilege it is to have Camila here who, who has submitted to you, has committed to following you, but not only just following you, but she's committed her life to helping develop other women in their faith as well. She has spoken gospel truths to women who has helped, she has helped show compassion to them and the love of Christ to them. And Father, we're just so grateful for her. And Father, as we send her out, we don't just send her out as father, mother, and brother, but we send her out as full brothers and sisters in Christ. This whole church sends her out, Father, to proclaim your good news in Orlando, in Apopka, and wherever she goes, and wherever you send her. But Lord, we will trust that you watch her going out and her coming in. Father, that your hand will continue to stay upon her. And Father, help us to support her in every aspect. So Father, we love you. Encourage her. Continue to build her up as you have been doing over the years. And Father, use her in ways that we can't even imagine. And Father, we love you. We pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Church family, we love you. As you leave, come say bye to Camila. Tell her your appreciation for her. Church family, we love you. Wait, before you leave, before you leave, before you leave, I have one more reminder. Don't forget that our members meeting is at 4 o'clock. And if you can stick around to help set up, that would be awesome. But totally, now, totally you are dismissed. Totally we love you guys.